Welcome to The Mission Matters. The Mission Matters is a partnership between 1615 and Missio Nexus who have a shared passion to mobilize God's people to be a part of His mission. The Mission Matters is hosted by Matthew Ellison, President of 1615, and Ted Esler, President of Missio Nexus. Make sure you like, share, and subscribe so you don't miss an episode. And now, here are your hosts, Matthew Ellison and Ted Esler. Well, hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Matthew Ellison, and if you are a frequent listener or viewer, you know that I'm not alone. I'm joined by my good friend and co-host, Ted Esler. Ted, it's great to see you, brother. Good to see you, Matthew. Hope you're doing well. I'm doing well. Listen, it's summertime. I'm going to commit a cardinal rule of, I'm going to break a cardinal rule of podcasting, and that is don't talk about time-sensitive stuff because you never know when the podcast is going to roll, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to color outside the lines here today. It's summertime right now. It may be fall when people listen to this, but uh, given that it's summertime, Ted, I'd like to know what your favorite summertime activity is to start off today. Well, that's easy for me because I live in Florida and summertime here is hot and it's humid. And so anything in the water, I happen to live on a lake, we have a boat and I like to wakeboard. And so we'll spend a lot of time. In fact, I'm I'm a little bit of a problem right now because I have a boat lift. And in Florida, before hurricane season starts, they lower the water level in all the lakes. And my lake is too low for me to get my boat off the boat lift. And it's July 4th weekend. So we're strategizing how we're going to get that boat off the boat lift so we can get it. As soon as it's off, I'll be fine. But Right now, it's about four and a half feet out of the water, which is too much of a spread for my boat lift. So that's what I like to do. How about you? Well, I'm going to copy you, Ted. I love the water. Uh, I grew up with a boat. My dad had a boat, and we went to the lake and water skied and scurf. I guess they call it wakeboarding now, but originally it was called scurfing, and I just loved it. Now, the problem is I live in New Mexico. I live in the desert, so... I don't have access to water like you do, but I do love the water. We have a pool in the backyard. And so water is what we want to do. We want to be in the water in the summertime. So very similar. Well, our guest today is Michael. And uh, Michael, I'm going to ask you the same question, what you like to do in the summertime. And after you answer that, just tell us a little bit about yourself, what you're doing. Well, it's not a question of what I like to do. It's what I end up doing. What I would like to be doing is spending time with my grandkids And very often at the beginning of the summer, we're watching the NHL playoffs or the NBA finals. I'm watching with my grandsons. That's what I enjoy doing. But my schedule is a little bit different in that I take much of my vacation time during the time between February and April. And uh, so much of my summer is working and that's my writing time. So I write, but I would rather be with my grandkids. Michael, tell us a little bit about your ministry. (laughs) Yeah, I, uh, I am a professor of missional theology at Covenant Theological Seminary, and we, uh, Covenant has a, uh, has a site, an extension site, which we actually we founded long before we actually connected with Covenant. Uh, it's in Phoenix, Arizona. It's called the Missional Training Center. And there we're doing a, a creative experiment in theological education, where we're training pastors and training leaders within the church, lay leaders, and uh, various other kinds of leaders within the church. And our what we do is we offer a Master of Arts degree in missional theology. So we're taking our clue from a lot of the literature of the 1960s and 70s and 80s um, that were written by uh, third world theologians or uh, leaders that were uh, emerging in the majority world, as well as leaders in the Western missionary movement who are trying to wrestle with what theological education should look like with an exploding church in the Southern Hemisphere. So we're trying to use some of that literature to shape our pedagogy, shape our structure, shape our uh, the way we do testing, the way we do assignments, but especially trying to form a missional curriculum. So that's what I do uh, throughout the school year. So um, I don't think we've said your last name. So listeners would know it's Michael Goheen. If I said that right, I think I did, right? You said it right. Just fine. Yeah. And I first came across your name. I, I picked up this book, Reading the Bible Missionally, which you edited. It's, I don't know, it's been out five, six years. And uh, 
as I started to read that book, I kind of was floored almost right away reading it because in the missions world, we don't get along well, I don't think, philosophically with the missional people. And I would say the missional people tend to write off the missions world. But right at the outset in your book, I just felt like, well, this is the same kind of thinking about mission work that we would have in the missions world, and yet it's a missional book. And so I thought we would get you on and talk a little bit about why there's this gap between the two. And so let's let's begin by, let's just talk a little bit of what, what do you mean when you use the word missional? What do you mean by that word missional? Well, boy, that's a big question. Um, it the, is. Word, the word missional is talking about the way uh, the role the church plays in the biblical story. So I might put it this way, that the biblical story has a missional direction. What I mean by that is the movement is from one people to the nations, from one geographical location to the ends of the earth. In other words, there's a missional direction to the biblical story. But then I would speak of the missional vocation of God's people. What is their role and calling within the story by which or through which God uses them to take the good news from the one to the many? And so I would use the word missional in that way that God's people from the very beginning have a vocation. And their vocation is oriented to God, what I would call the doxological uh, dimension of our vocation. We're called to fulfill God's purposes for his glory. But the missional vocation or the missional dimension of our vocation is uh, that we are called for the sake of the world. So the church then is not called simply to enjoy the benefits for themselves, but save for the sake of the world. Or put another way, that God works first of all in us, but then through us to be a channel of that salvific blessing to the ends of the earth. And so missional is trying to describe that movement. Well, let me, let me read a quote from the book. I hate it when people do that to me when they quote my book to me when they're interviewing me because I think, what did I write? But let me read this quote and get your reaction to it. As one New Testament scholar sympathetic to a missional hermeneutic puts it, biblical scholars have yet to be persuaded that mission can and should serve as a fundamental rubric for biblical interpretation. Many biblical scholars go on about their business paying little attention to this insight of their missiological colleagues, that mission is a central category in the Bible that needs to be taken seriously if our interpretation is to be faithful. Yes. So is that why we have the split going on between missional and missions? Because theologians don't take the, this whole missional perspective seriously? It may be part of it. I, I think it's a symptom as much as the uh, underlying cause. Um, I think that it goes much deeper. I think part of the mission and mission split comes from uh, the fact that the church has lived much of its life um, in a Christendom situation where the ends of the earth and the horizon of their vocation was basically out of view. And then when it did, when mission did reemerge, it was primarily um, a kind of a cross-cultural mission from one place to another. Um, and so uh, the very legitimate task of taking the good news to places where it has never been, where the gospel's never been heard or where there's not a witness, that le legitimate dimension of our vocation became the whole of our vocation. And so mission, what I would call missions, and I'll make that distinction in a moment, what I would call missions, that is taking the gospel to places where there is no witness, that became the whole of missions. But so much of the church then was remained very, if I can say it, um, unmissional. It remained uh, unaware of its vocation. And so what happened is people who were concerned for this cross-cultural mission from the West to the non-West gathered together and they began to form parachurch organizations. And those parachurch organizations at the end of, that grew through the 19th century and really exploded at the beginning of the 20th, those parachurch organizations, they weren't ecclesial, 
but they took they had the responsibility of mission but the churches had no sense of mission and so there is this split often between the church and between these um between these parachurch organizations one is involved with mission the other is involved with nurture and that and so the two have been split i think that's part of it and then I think as we have begun to discover that mission is much bigger and much broader than simply missions, taking the gospel to the ends of the earth, um, that as we've discovered that, I think some people have become very infatuated with it in a, maybe a very good way, and in so doing have forgotten that the horizon of that missional church in any particular place is the ends of the earth, and that there is a dimension involved in being a missional church that still is concerned to participate in taking that good news to places where it's never been heard. So I think part, and then maybe added to that, is a little bit of an embarrassment with the way that missions has been tied in with colonialism for so many years. And I think there's a, we could add other reasons as well, but I think the split between the two, um, sadly, is because we're not starting with that missional direction of the biblical story and that missional vocation of God's people. Once you do that, um, I think it's inevitable that mission, uh, missions as the expression of a missional church is very integral to what it means to be missional. So, Michael, one of the things that I've appreciated about the modern missional movement is this thrust to get people out of the building to be salt and light in the context of their own culture to share their faith rather than having these sequestered little you know centers of christianity but to infiltrate the culture i love that i I think that's a really positive thing that's come out of it and and i think more and more with the west becoming post-christian um you know like europe united states more and more a post-christian culture it requires a mission-like advance But this is a post-Christian culture, not a pre-Christian culture. And I think that's an important distinction because one of the things that concerns me, and you've hit on it a little bit, is that with the talk of everyone being a missionary and everything done in Jesus' name is missions, it seems to me that at least in the modern missional movement, the priority of taking the gospel cross-culturally has been obscured. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of missional churches, Michael, that could care less about the nations. I mean, I mean it. They, They literally say, my mission stops right here. Maybe you can address that. And ha- in my mind, you shouldn't call yourself missional if you're not doing missions. Um, mm-hmm. And you shouldn't call yourself missional if you're not being salt and light in your own context. But maybe you could speak to that. Yeah. Um, we've just uh, finished a book that's coming out next month, and it's called Becoming a Missionary Church. And then it's Leslie Newbegin and the various contemporary mission uh, mission church movements. And we look at the missional church movement, we look at the emergent church movement, and we look at the center church movement, Tim Keller's center church movement. And we look at it in light of Newbegin's uh, vision for the missional church, because he, in many ways, is the father of these things. And we note some of the big absences Uh, some of the things that are missing from Newbegin's vision in much of this literature, and we highlight missions as one of them. Let me give you two of his distinctions that were very fundamental, and they were both, uh, they were both, these distinctions were made both in about the 1960s, when mission was becoming a broader and broader and broader category, and especially in the ecumenical movement, missions as moving, taking the gospel to places where it had never been heard, missions was starting to recede, and starting to be, uh, and many people were embarrassed about it, and it was starting to slip. And he made these distinctions. The first distinction he made was between a missional dimension and missional intention. Missional, there is a missional dimension to all of our lives. For example, if I'm faithful to the good news in the way I love my wife, that is going to be a powerful witness to people. They're going to see that good news embodied in my life, and they might be drawn to Christ. And I can actually point to a few couples who come to Christ that way. But the fundamental, that's not the intention of getting married. Um, That's a dimension of my life. However, there are intentional activities like evangelism. Uh, like church planting, like cross-cultural missions that are intended to take the good news to people and call forth call forth from them a response of repentance and faith. So missional dimension 
our whole lives have the dimension of mission, but there are within that specific activities that have a missional intention to bring good news. Now, within a missional intention, Newbegin makes a distinction between mission and missions with an S. Now, I don't think that's the best way to do it, to be honest with you, but that's the way he's done it. That's the way I followed. Mission is the vocation of God's world, uh, of God's people in the world to make the good news known to the world. But within that, there is this one task, and that is to establish a witness, intentionally establish a witness to the gospel in places where there is none or where it is weak. And so for him, he did not want to lose that dimension of the missions task, but also he said it wasn't only, this is important, it wasn't only a dimension of the missional vocation of the church, missions was the ultimate horizon of the missional church. And he was convinced that you lose that sense of the horizon, you also are going to very quickly lose the sense of your own missional calling in your own neighborhood. So for him, missions was essential because it was a dimension of the church's mission and it because it was the ultimate horizon of the church's mission. So, in, so what has happened is that this has been sadly lost uh, in much of the missional church literature for a variety of reasons, some of which I mentioned. Yeah, so I'd be curious to get your input on the concept of, uh, you know, you've, you've probably heard Ralph Winter's term, sodality and modality. And, you know, I, I would probably talk more in terms of the missionary team that we see in the book of Acts versus the churches that were left behind. That's the nurture part that you were talking about. Um, I think most of the people that would be in the Missio Nexus community would embrace the fact that there are, uh, I call them ministry entrepreneurs that God calls to be goers. Um, do you think that there is a distinction between those that are small a apostolically called to go versus those that are called to stay? Or do you think that the concept of being on mission overwhelms that so that that distinction is not really valid? No, I think it's, I think it's a valid distinction in terms of our vocation. In other words, I think that what, where has God called us? He's called, called some of us to be pastors. He's called some of us to be business people. He's called some of us to be um, uh, engineers, housewives. He's called us to do many, many things and to bear witness to Christ in our lives, in our words, and in our deeds, in our particular vocation. And he's called some people, with a, particularly with the gift of evangelism, to plant churches here or abroad. And he's called some who have a, who have a gifting to be able to go to other par parts of the world and plant. So it's a matter of gifting to me, all within under the umbrella of the church. And so I think that it's an important gifting. I, I, I see my own view of mission and missions in the church at Antioch in chapter 11 and 13 of the book of Acts. In the book of Acts, you see the church at Antioch as a missional church. It's, in, it's uh, living in its place um, witnessing to the gospel in its lives, its words, its deeds, and the grace of God is on them, and God is adding to their numbers. But then they lift up their eyes, and they say there needs to be places in other parts of the world. There's, a, needs, there's other parts of the world where we need to establish communities like this one, like this church at Antioch, so that the, so that the various churches can bear witness to the good news in their place. And so I, I wonder if Paul didn't do something, metaphorically speaking, like a bishop in India used to do. He would go and he'd establish a community in a particular place. He'd only stay for a year or two. And after establishing that community, he'd take them into the town square. He'd tell them to put their hands on their head and to repeat after him, woe to me if I don't preach the gospel of Christ. And then he would raise his hands in bishopric blessing on them and say, now you are the mission in this place. I will help you when you need it, but now it's your vocation to make the gospel known here. And he would move on to the next place. And I think we see something like that in Paul, where he moves from place to place, establishing these witnessing congregations so that he can say in, in the book of Romans, in the last chapters, that my job is finished. I, I've done what God's called me to do, establish these witnessing communities in different places. And I think that's what missions is called to do. Uh, establish these witness communities in places where there is none, so that Antioch, 
what it's doing there can be multiplied into different places. Now, of course, mission has become bigger and broader uh, than church planting, but I think that's the major calling of missions. Yeah, I, I appreciate the distinction. Uh, you look at Antioch, as you mentioned, it's a church that's living missionally. It's socioeconomically diverse. It's ethnically diverse. It's a church I want to be a part of. It's just such a motley crew of people. And yet it didn't stop there for them like it did for Jerusalem. Jerusalem, the mission stopped in the neighborhood, if you will, um, in, in the Jewish neighborhood, if you will. Yeah. But in Antioch, everything changes. And this audacious church takes the gospel to the nations, missions, as you mentioned. And one of the things I love about it is they root their calling to reach the Gentiles, which we would call missions, as you're describing it, taking the gospel cross-culturally where it's never been. They rooted in the Old Testament. It wasn't new. They pull right. right out of Isaiah and say, this was our job from the beginning. It just, you know, we weren't doing it. Right. Um, so I'm going to put you on the spot. I think you've already answered the question. And Ted asked it in a um, more intellectual way. But do you believe everyone's a missionary? <laughs> Yes, no. I mean, <laughs> it, it, it depends entirely what you mean by that. Um, so what political office are you running for again? I forget. <laughs> so I ask you, I'd say, what do you mean by missionary? If what you mean by missionary is one of those people called to take good news to places where there is no witness, then I'd say, no, everybody's not a missionary. If what you're saying is, is everyone by their vocation, uh, of being a member of the covenant community called to bear witness to Christ in their lives, words and deeds, wherever they are with the entirety of their being, then yes, everybody's a missionary. I, if, you, if you're asking for my preference and how do I would use the word, I would save the word missionary for someone who goes to take the good news to other parts of the world. I would prefer that. Uh, a church I attend in, in Tempe, Arizona says that we are a family of missionaries. And I say, okay, I know what you're meaning. And I, and I, I, I I'm, I'm with you, but personally I'm um, language matters. And the way we use words uh, are an expression of our theology. And I would prefer to, to um, save that word. Now, let me make another distinction that maybe you will or will not like. A distinction that Newbigin made between uh, missions and what he called cross-cultural partnership. For him, cross-cultural partnership was when we go to other parts of the world and join the church there in partnering with them in their missional vocation. So if I go to Kenya, Africa, and I go to Nairobi, and I become a, a professor in their seminary, I'm not doing missions, according to Newbegin, I'm doing cross-cultural partnership. But if I go to the northern part of Kenya, where there are tribes that have never heard the good news, partnering with the Kenyan church to establish a witness in that place, then I'm doing missions. So missions is not defined by crossing an ocean. Missions is defined by the task of taking good news to places where it's never been heard. Now, it's not that this would cause people, as someone after reading my book, a missionary in Chile, after reading my book on introducing Christian mission today, I spend the last chapter on missions. He basically says, it made me struggle. Am I a missionary or not? Well, it's not meant to make people struggle with that question hard. Rather, it's meant to focus our task to make sure the good news is being taken to places it's never been heard. And the problem is, as one author puts it, it's he speaks of the, uh, the way we have misused our missionary resources where 90 to 95 percent of our personnel and financial resources are going towards cross-cultural partnership rather than towards missions, rather than towards establishing a witness in places where there is none. So I think what we need to do is say, where are there places in the world where there is no witness so that we can establish one there? Is cross-cultural partnership a legitimate part of the church's mission? Absolutely. Matter of fact, I think it's essential. I just want to make sure that we hold on to that so that we can keep very clear in our minds that we, there is this dimension of mission that every local congregation should be taking part of, in to take good news to places and to establish a witness in that place where there is none. I, I mean, you're not going to get any pushback from Matthew or I on that, no. on that approach. I, I think in our community, we would tend to talk about church development. In other words, you're going to work alongside an existing church to make it healthier or better. That's great. And, be, and one reason for that is because church partnership today can also mean your church here partnering with a church that's cross-cultural, but the actual objective is to meet a third, 
meet the needs of a third culture that don't have the gospel. But that's kind of an aside. I, I want to get to one more topic. I think that's that's I really appreciated reading about in this this uh, this book. And that has to do with the narrative of scripture and narrative theology and its importance for understanding mission. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you could just briefly touch on that. I think, you know, again, people that are in the missions with an S community, I think they are big on narrative theology and narrative thinking, but I'm not so sure that's true in the broader church. And I'm not so sure I've seen a lot of that in the missional community, but maybe I'm wrong about that. Could, could you unpack that a little bit? What, what you mean by the importance of that this uh, narrative approach? Well, Ted, that, that's been what my life has been about. The first book I published was Drama of Scripture, and my life has been about making that. I believe that the, that the essence and the heart of the Christian faith is this, that the Bible tells the true story of the world at which Christ is the center. So we have to understand Christ in the context of the biblical story, and we have to read the biblical story through the light of Christ. I think that is the Christian faith. Not one way of looking at it, it is the Christian faith. And we see that with Irenaeus in the first church, the first theologian to struggle with what in the world is the Christian faith as he struggles with the Gnostics who are using the same language um, as, the, as the church. And he says, you're a heretic because you don't you are putting Christ in the wrong story, in the Gnostic story rather than the Old Testament story. And so he writes his catechism and the catechisms that followed for the next 300 years were all the narrative of scripture from creation to consummation. That's the heart of the Christian faith. And that narrative was lost in the Enlightenment. But anyway, that's another story. And so I think that narrative is essential for the Christian faith. And I'll just make, uh, again, two points in this. Number one, when God's mission was expressed for the first time in the middle 20, of the 20th century, that was expressed as a shorthand for the narrative of Scripture. When it says God, the Father sent the Son, the Son sent the Spirit, and the Father, so the Father and the Son sent the Spirit, and the Son sent the Church and the power of the Spirit, that little formula, which has been said many times, was meant to be a shorthand expression for the entire narrative. The two people who wrote that in Willingen both were deeply committed to the Bible as a story, and they were expressing that story. But what has happened in much missional theology is that that, that that little formula has become a schema and has been disconnected from the story and has been filled with other visions of the Trinity rather than the narrative Trinity, if you want me to put it that way, and the, and the story. And so back when the whole, the, what, we, what we might say, where the missional church vision was being founded in the deepest theological sense, it was rooted in the narrative of Scripture. Mm -hmm. And it was rooted in this unfolding narrative from creation to consummation. And so I believe that mission is ultimately defined by the role that God's people play in that story. And if they don't play that role in that story, they're not being the missional people as they're called. When God chooses and covenants with the people, it's so that he can work in them to bring uh, salvation and renewal to them, but then through them to bring it to the world. And the missional direction of that story makes that role very clear. So I believe that's absolutely essential. So Michael, let me ask, how can listeners, viewers read the Bible in such a way as to not miss the narrative? Because I, I know, I know Ted knows, and I'm not trying to be harsh towards the church. I love the church. But so much of the messaging coming out of pulpits, it's focused not on the plot line or the narrative. It's, it's all these sub stories, these subplots. And so people miss the larger picture of what God is up to. And they miss, as you say, that, you know, the, the, the destiny, the, where eternity is headed. Um, it, it's the consummation. It's the Lamb of God being worshipped by representatives from every nation, tribe, and tongue. That's where history is headed. H how do you read the Bible in such a way is there a question you might ask yourself as you open up the book so that you don't miss the larger narrative? Well, maybe what we need to do is go to Luke 24 and it's where Jesus says, and he opened their minds mm. so they could understand the scripture. Basically, he's giving them a hermeneutical key. 
And the hermeneutical key is twofold. Number one, you read the light of the story in light of my death and resurrection. That salvation that I've been renewing work, I've been working, culminates in my death and resurrection. But the grammar there continues. And that this good news goes to the nations. That's the second hermeneutical key. The first is a messianic key. The second is a missional key. In other words, the way that uh, this this renewal that I've been working out, out and promising to Abraham would go to the nations. The way that's going to go to the nations is now the book of Acts. So Luke gives us the first key. The book of Acts gives us the second hermeneutical key. And we realize that Jesus is telling the story three times in that chapter. He tells the story. So, I mean, that's a good hermeneutical key, but what do you do practically? It just seems to me that first of all, leaders got to be gripped by this. Yeah. Uh, if it's not part of theological training, they're not going to be doing it. But once they're gripped by it, it should affect their preaching. I, I, I talk about this so often. That it needs to affect their preaching. They need to shape their worship so that they're inviting people into that story and worship. But I think the biggest thing is what Dallas Willard calls the elephant in the room discipleship. I think it's precisely in hard, in hard discipleship of nourishing, bringing people into that story based as new members class, as new believers class, and then ongoing discipleship is nurturing people in that story. You know, we wrote drama of scripture, and then what we did is we turned it into a shorter book called The True Story of the Whole World, so that it could be used in small groups in churches to help this discipleship process. And it's, it's been used quite a bit that way. But one of the things that we were encouraged by was the first 300 years of the church. That's how they did discipleship. They didn't do it through question and answer. Who is God? What is sin? Who made the world? They didn't ask questions and answers. That's not all bad, but the, what they did was they in the, what their stated goal in the first 300 years in catechism was to give a new identity to the people of God through a new story by detoxifying them from the Roman story so they could be attractive and take up their role as God's people in the story. So I think that that's, we, we need to recover that vision Hmm. of the people of God, what it means to follow Christ, what it means to be part of the church, and the role and calling of leaders uh, to disciple God's people. Good stuff. Ted? I, I mean, I, you're, you're getting a bunch of amens from us, and, and we're definitely, I would say, in the missions with the S world, so uh, that's awesome. That's Yeah, that's Ted, what a great uh, conversation this has been. I'm glad you teed this one up. Yeah, it's been good. It's been good. Hey, Michael, hang on here. We're going to close out the program with a segment we call What Does Ted Like? So, Ted, <laughs> what is it that you like today? So something that I like and something that I've been my wife and I have been doing now for probably about a year and a half. Uh, some of you are going to know what I'm talking about right away. and Some of you will have no idea, but it's called a little library and uh, little libraries. Uh, you know, I'm from the Midwest. In Minneapolis, there's a lot of them, but it's when you you put a small free library in your yard or in front of your house. Now, if you're in an apartment, I don't know how you'd pull this off, but we've had a little library in the front of our house now for quite a while. And it's incredible the amount of community and conversations it generates. And it's just a little box that I built. It kind of looks like our house. It has a glass front. And then inside it, we put in books that we've read and we're not going to read again. And other people bring books to us. We have people that drive into our little cul-de-sac area here and they drop books off. We see people come with their cars or their bikes and they pull up there and they take books out. And we basically have had an ongoing source of relationships and connections with our little neighborhood community here because we have a little library. Hmm. So if you're looking to connect with people in your community, and there's even a, a association, you can get your little library listed online, and there's advice on you can buy the little library, uh, or you can build your own. Uh, it's just a great way to make a good, friendly connection with your neighbors. I've had a few neighbors just say to me, we're so glad you do this. It just makes it feel more like we're a community when this is going on. So invest in your community. Think about putting in a little library. That's what I like. So, Michael, is that an example of living missionally? <laughs> uh, living missionally is living as living faithfully as a believer. Yeah. In other words, living in such a way that 
our lives are bearing witness to Christ in every way. But I would say that that can be used intentionally to connect with our neighbors if that's what you do initially in a wonderful way. Awesome. Hey, Michael, yeah. let's close by letting folks know where they can get your books. I suspect on Amazon. All um, right. There you most, go. Of, most of my books are published by Baker. Um, one is published by Inter InterVarsity, Introducing Christian Mission Today, and one published by Eerdmans. That's the one that Ted picked up, uh, Reading the Bible Missionally. But So no, your new book is coming out when? Yeah, I just got it. We just got it in the mail the other day. All and, right. Uh, it's just came in. And this is based, uh, three or four years ago, I wrote a book on uh, Leslie Newbegin's Missional Ecclesiology. And then this is now analyzing. It just came out. It's going to be for sale in about a week or two. So uh, and the title of that one again is what? Becoming a Missionary Church, Leslie Newbegin and Contemporary Church Movements. This should deal with missional, emergent and center church movement. All right. Great. Well, Michael, it's great having you on. And uh, Matthew, until next time. Until next time. Before you go, would you visit our host's websites? There you will find a wealth of interesting and challenging information about the state of the Great Commission. They are 1615.org and missionexus.org. If you enjoyed today's episode, please like, share, and subscribe so you don't miss one. Mission Matters is presented through a partnership between 1615 Missions Coaching and Missio Nexus.